Welcome to the 19th of our conversations about God. Another look at our Heavenly Father in the larger setting of the great controversy over His character and government. The topic for our conversation this time is how soon will the conflict be over? During the last three conversations, we talked about when the conflict will be over. We discussed how it will be over when God's children on this planet have fully responded, yes or no, to His final pleading. The conflict will be over when His loyal children on this planet have become so settled into the truth that they will be ready to resist Satan's final efforts to deceive. And the conflict will be over when, like grown-up believers. They not only know the truth well enough to survive themselves, but like Job, they know it well enough to speak well and truly of their Heavenly Father. And so the question for tonight is not when will the conflict be over, but rather how soon will it be over? Do you think the end will come, the conflict will be over, Christ will return in our own lifetime? Well, the disciples wondered about this, do you remember? And they asked Jesus, as in the first of the texts on our Bible reference sheet, Matthew 24, 3. Tell us, they said, when will this be? And how can we tell when you're coming back and the world will come to an end? And Jesus replied that even the angels do not know. In fact, he added that while he was still in his humble human form on this planet, that even he did not know himself, only the Father. Look again at Matthew 24, 36, next on the sheet. Jesus' own words. But about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, only the Father. But Jesus went on to indicate that there was something much more important than knowing the exact time. He indicated that it was far more important to trust Him enough to be willing to wait. And you recall our conversation, all God asks of us is trust. For if only we trust Him enough, to be ready for His coming whenever that should be. We really don't need to know the exact time, but if we trust Him, all will be well. And Jesus indicated this in the next verse, in John 14, 1 and 3. Set your troubled hearts at rest on this subject, He said. Trust in God always. Trust also in Me. I shall come again and receive you to Myself, so that where I am, you may be also." But he did give them some details by which they could tell the approximate time. And as they sat together one day on the Mount of Olives, Jesus spoke of many signs by which the disciples could tell when the end was getting nearer. Very familiar passages to all those who believe in the Advent. He spoke of alarming disturbances in earth and sky. He spoke of growing distrust between the nations. 
Uh, he spoke of uh, the rise of false religious leaders, subjects that we've discussed before. He particularly warned of those who would arise and teach that his second coming was to be in secret. Don't believe that, Jesus said, as in the next passage, Matthew 24, 26, 27, 30, and 31. Don't believe it, that is, don't believe that I'll be coming in secret. For the Son of Man will come like the lightning which flashes across the whole sky from the east to the west. And all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The great trumpet will sound, and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to the other. Now that's hardly the description of an invisible event. Quite on the contrary, John affirmed very clearly in the last book in the Bible that every eye will see him come. And you remember that passage in Revelation 1, 7, every eye will see him. Now in the passage we read above from Matthew, he speaks of all the people on the earth weeping as they see the Son of Man coming back. But as we read other passages, we note that not everyone will be weeping. Those who've learned to trust him will be very glad to see him come. And way back in the days of Isaiah, this was clearly predicted. Look at Isaiah 25, verse 9. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. But as we've considered in recent discussions, Revelation 13 describes that most of the world, in the end, will have turned against God. And because they have not learned to trust him, even though Jesus comes back in his human form, they flee from him in terror. Look at Revelation 6.16 next on the list. They even call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now how could they possibly flee from gentle Jesus, meek and mild, as the little children often like to pray to him? It's true, he does come back in his majesty and power unveiled, but still, there is no need to be afraid. But Satan has so convinced these others that God is arbitrary, vengeful, and severe, that those who have not learned to trust in God will actually flee from him as he cries after them, Why will you die? How can I give you up? How can I let you go? So thoroughly has Satan convinced all these people that his lies about God are the truth. How Peter and Judas both looked at that same gentle but powerful and majestic face. One of them was moved to repentance, and the other one was moved to go out and take his own life. Now our Lord is not two-faced. The difference is in us. And those who've learned to welcome the good news, the gospel, the truth about our God, have learned to trust and admire God for his wise and gracious ways. They will be ready to see him come, even to see him in his glory, and not be afraid, awestruck to be sure, but not scared of our God. But those who have despised and rejected this good news will actually look at the one who died for them, and like Judas, be driven by that sight to suicide. Of all the things Jesus said must and will happen before the conflict is over, he especially mentioned one. He said the gospel, the good news, the true picture of God, 
simply must go to all the world before the end will come. Now, we could trust God to wait until His children all over this planet have had a chance to make an enlightened choice and decision, as we've discussed before, in view of the awesome events to come, the confusion and the deception. God would not ask anyone to pass through that period without sufficient information upon which to base an intelligent choice. And this is only consistent with the way God has treated angels and men ever since the great controversy began. He's always waited patiently for His children to make up their own minds. You think of how many centuries He waited for Israel to respond to the invitations and the warnings of the prophetic messengers that He sent one after the other. And not until the children of Israel had resisted the truth so long that they were beyond even the Creator's power to restore, did He finally and reluctantly give them up. But after the Israelites had been taken off into Babylonian captivity, God inspired the writer of Second Chronicles to explain why He could no longer protect them why he had to let them go. Look at Second Chronicles 36, 15 and 16 on the sheet. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people, grossly as many of them were misbehaving, as you know from the biblical record. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets, till the wrath of the Lord, and we know that means His sadly giving people up from Romans and Hosea and elsewhere, till the wrath of the Lord rose against the people, till there was no remedy, not an arbitrary decision. He simply could not do anything more for them, and He let them go into the discipline of captivity. Fortunately, it was not the final awful destruction at the end of the world. It still was discipline. And though God seemed to have abandoned them, He went with them, didn't He? He blessed Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Esther, Mordecai, Ezekiel. Think of the distinguished saints that grew up there in Babylonian captivity. But by and large, God could not work through His people as a nation at that time. He had to give them up into the discipline of captivity. Now, sometimes this patience of God that's mentioned so many, many times in the 66 books, this patience has been misunderstood to mean that we can go on sinning with impunity because our God is simply too kind and too patient to discipline us or to turn us over to destructive consequences. And you remember how Paul warned of how serious an error that can be this era of presuming on the kindness of God. Look at Romans 2.4. Are you perhaps misinterpreting God's generosity and patient mercy toward you as weakness on His part? Don't you realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? An excellent translation of that famous verse. Now, sometimes God's patience has even puzzled his trusting children. You recall that in the days of Habakkuk, they cried out to God, Why don't you do something? Why don't you come and rescue us and help us in our predicament? They even were in despair that God seemed to be doing nothing. And so the prophet Habakkuk was sent to urge them not to give up their faith, but to trust God enough to be willing to wait and let God work out His plans in His own good time. As Micah says, the problem often is that we simply don't understand God's plan. Let us trust Him as we seek to understand it more and give Him time to do it in His own time and in His own way. I wish we could have included all of Habakkuk in our Bible reference sheet, but just looking at Habakkuk 2, verse 3, when the prophet sums up his message, it may seem slow in coming, 
but wait for it. It will certainly take place. In fact, God's first message was to Habakkuk was, I am doing something, but you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Habakkuk says, try me, Lord, tell me. And the Lord did. And Habakkuk indicated that he was willing to wait. And that's the source of that great verse, the just, the righteous, God's friends will live in faith, in trust. That verse was not written about forgiveness. It was written about trusting God enough to be willing to wait. That great verse that Paul picked up in Romans is the most appropriate one for those who wonder why the Lord still waits. In these last days, God's patience even gives His enemies an opportunity to misinterpret His graciousness as weakness and even to scoff at God's apparent inability to bring the conflict to a successful conclusion. And here I wish we could have included the whole of 2 Peter chapter 3. But look first at 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4, where Peter warns that in the last days there will come men who scoff at religion and live self-indulgent lives. And they will say, where now is the promise of his coming? Our fathers have been laid to their rest, but still everything continues exactly as it has always been since the world began. Doesn't that sound like the familiar doctrine of uniformitarianism? Nothing has ever changed and nothing ever will. But Peter goes on to explain the real reason for the delay. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the next verse on the list, it is not that the Lord is slow in fulfilling His promise as some suppose, but that He is very patient with you, because it is not His will for any to be lost, but for all to come to repentance. And then Peter, if you could read on in the chapter, he refers to Paul's earlier advice in Romans 2.4, higher on our reference, Bible reference sheet today. And he writes in his letter, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience with us is our salvation, as our beloved brother Paul wrote in his letter, I'm sure referring to Romans 2.4. Maybe more seriously, Sometimes God's incredible graciousness has even been an embarrassment to some of His people. You remember when the prophet Jonah was asked by God to go and give a serious message of warning to Nineveh. At first, he ran away. Later, under considerable pressure, he went and delivered his message, hardly a missionary volunteer. Think of the pressure the Lord had to put on Jonah to get him to go up there to Nineveh and deliver a very serious message to a very dangerous people, to be sure. And Jonah walked the streets and said, In forty days Nineveh will be destroyed. And then he went out and sat down on a hillside nearby to watch the city come to its end. But it didn't. The people of Nineveh repented and the city was not destroyed. And Jonah complained angrily to God, and he said, God, that's why I ran away. I knew you were far too kind to go through with that threat, with that prediction. You've made me look like a false prophet. I'm humiliated enough to die. See part of his words here on the Bible reference sheet. In Jonah 4, 2 and 3, imagine saying this to God. Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. Now then, Lord, let me die. I am better off dead than alive. Think of this man knowing God that well in Old Testament times. 
Those are words Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, Abraham would have been proud to speak. They never used better words than that about our God. But Jonah was ashamed. This had caused him embarrassment. He was humiliated enough. He felt his reputation had been so destroyed that he was prepared to die. God reasoned with frustrated Jonah. Have you no pity for these people? Aren't you glad that they've chosen to repent? He even mentioned the, the uh, cattle in the city. Don't you even care about them at the end of the book? But Jonah was much more concerned about his own reputation, his own reputation as a reliable prophet. Moses, Abraham, Jeremiah, Paul, all announced themselves as proud to know God as they did, proud of him and proud of the good news. Jonah also knew God, but he was ashamed. About a century and a half ago, there arose in various parts of the world the growing conviction that the coming of Christ was very near. You know the history, how Bible students in many different churches began to see in certain remarkable events the fulfillment of some of the signs that Jesus gave to his disciples in Matthew 24. Among other things, they looked for the fulfillment of those famous signs listed in Matthew 24, next on our sheet, Matthew 24, 29. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky. And they saw in the darkening of the sun on May 19, 1780, and in a remarkable falling of the stars on November 13, 1833, combined with their study of certain other lines of prophecy in, in Daniel and Revelation, uh, lines that pointed to the dates 1798 and 1844, as being the dates of certain important events, they saw in all these things an accumulation of evidence and signs and indications that the long-looked-for advent was very near. And we do know it is a historical fact that the great Second Advent movement began at that time. Though some are now puzzled about the signs and the dates, it is an incontrovertible fact of history. That's when the great Second Advent movement did begin. And the time when it did begin is the time when all those remarkable signs and prophetic periods all seem to come together. It's not one date, one event, one piece of evidence. It's all that evidence combined, and that's the way God has always sought to convince us throughout the history of the conflict not a little here and a little there, but the accumulation of the evidence. Now, some of those eager Adventists were led by their study of the times and the evidences to begin giving special attention to the messages of the three angels in Revelation 14. And they came to the conclusion that the time had arrived for these three messages of warning and invitation to be given to the whole world a very bold venture they undertook, and the excitement and the disappointment of those days is all part of religious history. There are still thousands, even millions of Christians the world around who agree that those early Adventists had indeed seen God's signal that the Second Coming was near. They didn't read it correctly at first. It was not a signal to pack for the trip up to heaven. It was rather a call from God to prepare the whole world for His coming. That's why we're still here, because we haven't done it yet. Now, it's true that time has continued much longer than early Adventists expected. The signs that so stirred them are now well over a hundred years old. 
In fact, the first of the signs, the darkening of the sun and the turning of the moon to blood, May 19, 1780, that sign is now 204 years old. But are we surprised? Are we even ashamed that our God would be willing to wait this long? Are we concerned about our reputation or His? The good news, the gospel, it's not about us. Sometimes I think we make that mistake. The good news is not about us. The good news is about our God. Now, if by our failure to complete our task, we may have contributed to the long delay, then we deserve to be ashamed. But the longer God waits, the more gracious He looks. His delay only confirms the good news. I think the delay should lead us to speak with pride of our God and not to make the awful mistake that Jonah made. You see, God needs better spokesmen than Jonah proved to be. Reluctant teachers of the truth, moved only by fear or obligation, are themselves a very sad denial of the good news. God is waiting for people who look eagerly for the coming of the day of God and work to hasten it on. But I've quoted Peter. Look at 2 Peter 3.12 on the Bible reference sheet. He advised way back in the first century, look eagerly for the coming of the day of God and work to hasten it on. So now the question, how much longer do you think God will have to wait? Well, we can trust God to wait just as long as there is hope for anyone. You know He will do that. We can also trust God not to wait forever. He will not wait a moment longer than it makes sense to do so. Who longs more, as we mentioned last time, to bring everything to an end and recreate this world and give it to His trusting saints? When then will it end? Only God, the one who reads our every thoughts, will know when all final decisions have been made. And that's why Jesus gave the serious advice in Matthew 24, 44. So then, disciples, you also must always be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you are not expecting Him. But unless that should leave us with the impression that we're entirely in the dark about this, we should also add Paul's counsel in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, the last of the verses for this evening. But you, brothers, are not living in darkness, and so the day will not, like a thief, take you by surprise. You see, like the angels, we too do not know the exact day or hour. But we do know what must take place and what will take place before the end comes, and we can count on it. After all these years, and after paying such a price, God is not about to change His way of leading the family, nor is He about to fail. Consistently with the way God has always handled this conflict in the family, never asking us to believe without evidence, not claims but demonstration, and this takes time. We know that God will not come until the world has been warned, and He will not come until His children are ready. But when they are ready, He'll waste no time. He then will come. So, how soon do you think the conflict will be over?
shall I say, for the 19th time. Why not? You will come out and <laughs> raise <coughs> questions that can well be raised on this subject. Our uh, question tonight, how soon will the conflict be over, from what you've said, seems to be tied in very closely with, with the second coming of Christ. And, and what I'm wondering is, <clears throat> um, is that really the end of the conflict? Is that what you're saying this evening? Or aren't there some other very important events, such as um, the millennium, the uh, destruction of the wicked, that are part of what we might call the conflict? That's true. There are major events yet to come after. But um, the second coming really does mark the, the end of the essential conflict, because the conflict is not so much um, um, a great war in which the powers of heaven are arrayed against the powers of earth, and God will eventually move in and bring it to an end. The, the, the essential conflict is in the minds of His children, of angels and of men. And the second coming means it's all over. The loyal are committed forever to loyalty, and the disloyal are committed forever to their rebellious rejection. So this is the conflict that really counts, and that has many significant um, implications. This is the important conflict that takes place in our minds. We've talked how the most essential thing is for God to demonstrate the truth about Himself, and some will object, well, that doesn't make us very important. No, if His demonstration does not lead some of us to conviction in our minds. He's failed. And uh, so we're not just pawns. He's trying to win us. We are very much involved in this conflict. This conflict is being fought in the minds of His own children. Oh, this takes us back to the very beginning, to our first conversation about the nature of the conflict, doesn't it? Yeah. Really, and that it's not a struggle of power and, and armies and D-Day. He could have handled that, that in one minute but it is a struggle for uh, trust, decisions, right. and that kind of thing. So you see, again, we're not just spectators of the conflict. We're very much involved, oh, though certainly. the most important question is about Him. You know, in, in your introduction here, you uh, quote from 1 John, and here, so many years ago, the Apostle John writes, children, it is the last hour. We know that it is the last hour. Now, as you, as you <laughs> ask the question here, I have to ask it again. Was, was John wrong? I'd like to trace that all the way through the Bible and note that all the Bible writers who deal with the subject describe the end as near. Remember Joel and all the rest of them? Jesus Himself, the end is very near. One could look at the statement in Peter that with the Lord a thousand years are as a day, and a day is a thousand years. Then also John saw Antichrist there, and that led him to to believe that the end was near. And then there are other ways in which it's near. John died soon after this. You know, he was in his 90s. And one night, perhaps when he went to bed, soon after, after writing this, he fell asleep. And John awakened the next morning, it would appear, from perhaps the most refreshing sleep he's ever had. And lo, it's the second coming. Now, he might have some questions, you know, but I doubt he'll have any complaints. And as far as witnessing all the great closing events, he will witness everything from there on. The millennium, the third coming, the recreation of the world. John won't miss any of that. All he'll miss is really the time of trouble. <laughs> I like the way you put that. He, that. he uh, may have some questions, but no complaints. I don't think he'll have any complaints. Now, now John, Same way with saints now who fall asleep, as we discussed before, yes. before the Lord comes. They will arise in time. They'll even rise first. Uh, John talks about, about Antichrist. Now, what, what is the Antichrist? What, what do we mean by that term? Yeah, the word anti suggests opposition, and the opposition is expressed in many ways. The most destructive is not open opposition, but subtle misrepresentation. I mean, anyone who misrepresents Christ is an antichrist. So it's not just one person in all the history of the, of the world. There have been many, many antichrists. But John says in his day, now many antichrists have appeared. By the way, I think he was referring back to what Paul wrote in Thessalonians that there's more to happen, Antichrist will appear. And John says, well, now he has. See, Antichrist has been working all these hundreds and thousands of years. I believe the end has always been very, very near. If the conditions could be met, God would have foreseen their being met, and everything would have ended much sooner. In uh, the second text in our Bible reference sheet, Jesus says that He doesn't know 
the time, um, nor the hour, the day nor the hour. Uh, he, that statement, of course, was made back in the Mount of Olives as he's talking to his mm -hmm. disciples. Mm -hmm. That statement was true then. Is it still true? Does Jesus not know now? Uh, well, I would understand he's taken back all his kingly power, and he knows. But well, the verse in Philippians, when he was here, he really emptied himself. And he lived as a human to show that humans, by the power of God, can lead good lives. And so he used no power that we cannot use. He often spoke and acted as a prophet. Uh, so I, I accept what he said then. He really didn't know at the time, but he does know now. I'm impressed, though, that it says the Father knows. Now, um, some wonder how much the Father can know about the future. If the conflict is in our minds, if the conflict is over trust, then the conflict is over moral choices. What's happening in our minds. What's happening in our minds. And Jesus says, the Father knows when the world will have made up its mind and will have made these moral choices. This is my basis for believing that God can foreknow our moral choices, or how could he know the day or the hour when the conflict will be over? That's why I take that position. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've talked about the signs and some of these signs that many of us here this evening have, have uh, lived with oh, and yes. have thought about, but they do seem a bit far away at times. Uh, didn't he also go on to talk about this generation, the, the generation that saw some of these signs wouldn't pass away? If, if you're right about the dates of these other signs, 1798 and 1833 and some of these other dates, um, was Jesus wrong about this generation? I think I know about 12 different explanations of this generation, and they're all an attempt to, to extend it longer and longer. Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, it was such good news to read in the paper that somebody living in outer Mongolia on yogurt had made it to his 167th <laughs> birthday. We say, oh good, the generation is still alive. I mean, that generation is long since gone. I'd have to put this with all the other similar places in the Bible. We could have completed the work back in those days. We could have done it. God has always held these things out before us. So I believe the generation that saw those signs that you mentioned should have seen the end. Is it possible that there are still some more signs that uh, we're waiting for or should be looking for? For example, yeah. now you didn't mention uh, Daniel 12.4, well, one. one that uh, I've heard as far back as I can remember, yeah. knowledge shall be increased and uh, men and women shall run to and fro. Yeah, the beauty of that one is it can be updated all the time and, and kept current. Um, it's very interesting to look at the pictures on the old signs of the time, since Dad edited that for so long. And you see the earlier covers of men running to and fro in uh, antiquated uh, Model Ts, and uh, even before that, antiquated locomotives. But periodically, they had to send the word out to the art department, update this, because people are now running a little faster to and fro, and knowledge is increasing. And, you can see the evolution of the airplane and as well as the automobile. And then, of course, the, when the first rocket went up and Sputnik was going around, the word had to go out to the art department, update Daniel 12.4. Anything that can be updated all these hundreds of years isn't much use as a sign. If it's, if it's an indication that increase of knowledge and speed of transportation says the end is near. So I have to go back and read Daniel 12.4 in Daniel. It's the knowledge of the prophecies of the book of Daniel that will increase as a result of people urgently searching. The words in Daniel are the same as in Amos. There'll be a famine, famine for the word. People will be running to and fro looking for it and will not find it. So in the context of Daniel 12, in the Hebrew, I believe this means that those prophecies in Daniel which were sealed up till the time of the end would in the time of the end be studied and as a result, people will come to an understanding of the predictions in Daniel, and the great Second Advent movement will begin. And this is what happened. So I would date the fulfillment of Daniel 12 for 1798, so, you know, around the turn oh, of the century. So this belongs with all those other signs uh, at the same time. But talking about fulfilled prophecies reminds me of a question that one of our, our listeners and uh, who's been here uh, wrote out very nicely for us. Uh, he says, what answer might I give my neighbor who believes that Israel will once again become a great nation. And uh, there are many unfulfilled promises, promises to Israel. He believes that these promises have yet to be fulfilled, and he bases his beliefs 
on Jeremiah 31, 35, and 36, Isaiah 2, 2 to 5, Romans 11, and mm -hmm. so forth, Isaiah 31. Mm -hmm. And this friend of, of our friend who believes this uh, does not accept these promises in the Old Testament as conditional and that they ended when Christ dies. He says, God will keep his promises to Abraham. Now, here's someone who think, thinks that, that things that are happening to the country of Israel mm -hmm. must uh, be tied in with the events that have to take place. Well, what I like is his selection of verses. They're all excellent verses. But if one were to lay those uh, side by side, all of them express some qualifications. For example, in Romans, Paul says, not all the physical descendants of Abraham are real Israelites, only the children of the promise. And uh, Isaiah says that though the children be as the sand of the sea for multitude, only a remnant will be saved, because only a remnant will respond. And Jeremiah says, only those in whose hearts my law has been written will be my, be my loyal children. Every one of those writers suggests that many of Abraham's physical children will not be among God's loyal people. But then Paul goes on to say, but those whose hearts are circumcised, they will be regarded as uh, true Israelites. So I think if, if one were to take the passages listed there, one would have the answer. I would not look to what's happening in Israel today and as an it, indication. Are you're, and you're saying they're not a group of prophecies or events that uh, we're waiting for, that kind of thing? No. God is looking at um, the people in Palestine today as He looks at all the other people in the world. If they trust Him, all will be well. You mentioned that uh, the coming, in one sense, has been near for centuries. Yeah. Do you think this delay, is it, is it all right to use that word, delay? It really seems like a delay. Do you think that's caught God by surprise? Well, <laughs> your comment makes me remember, my Lord delayeth His coming. It's thought to be a bad thing to say. Now, in the story, the Lord did delay His coming. What was bad was He began misbehaving as the Lord delayed His coming. The Lord has in mercy delayed His coming. But I see the Bible as foreseeing this many, many times, like Jesus' story of the ten girls. The bridegroom tarried, the bridegroom delayed, and they all slept, even the saintly five. They slept. And then you think of other places, the four winds being held that we discussed last time. They're held until an angel stands and says, there shall be no more delay. That Revelation 10, 6 verse, I should have had it in the collection. Uh, there shall be no more delay. And then the whole chapter in 2 Peter 3 that explains the delay. And, um, well, maybe that's enough place. So the Bible very clearly prepares us for apparent delay, but don't misunderstand it. And God hasn't been caught by surprise. Not by surprise. Uh, He's by even this. forewarned us of it. You know, I was looking down through our, our Bible reference sheet. I wonder if some of you had the same problem that I did as I read along, for instance, in the third paragraph there. I came across early Adventist believers, and there's a small a. And I guess I'm so used to seeing it with a large A. Was that a typographical error here? There's another place where it, it, the next paragraph, first line. It's two of them. What happened there? No, I proofread that with care. That's deliberately a little a because there are many other Adventists besides Seventh-day Adventists. We've been rather possessive about that name. Every year my dad used to go to the Congress on Prophecy and sit with Adventists of many different denominations who believed in the Second Advent. Now, how are you using the word Adventist there? People who are anticipating the oh. Advent. All right. Yes. Not a, not a denomination, you see. Now, you and I are both, are both Adventists with the big A. That is, That's we right. belong to a church that, that wants to emphasize the return of Christ right. by including that uh, truth in its name. Um, you grew up, as I did, with our dads talking about the end being near. Yeah. I can remember as a small boy reading that magazine that your father edited for so many years, so capably, Signs of the Times. And <clears throat> uh, I, I just can't help but ask you this question. With all of that background, and it's a question I've asked myself too, do you still believe that the end is near? Um, I, I guess I want to say, you know, do you really think Jesus is coming soon? Well, I asked my father that. Uh, I heard him preach the nearness of the end for 55 years. He, he worked right up until he died. When I was a small boy, too, I used to go around England with my father, and I would sing and read the Scripture, and he'd preach on the nearness of the end. He always preached on the nearness of the end. So just before he died, I asked him, do you still believe it after all these years? 
He said, had I seen and known all the things we've seen and learned these last few years, I would have preached it with much greater vigor. I don't know how he could have if you remember how <laughs> he used to right, preach. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dad was absolutely convinced. There's more evidence now. But it is true that God is evidently waiting as we could count on him to. That's even part of the good news. That's some of the most important evidence, his willingness to wait, though he's so eager to terminate things. You know, I uh, had the privilege of being your father's pastor. That's he was right. a member of my church right. for a couple of years up there in Mountain View, and I was always blessed by the, the vigorous mm -hmm. conviction and, <laughs> and, and confidence in the soon coming of Christ. Right. And I, I came to the conclusion that your father and my father are looking for the return of someone they love deeply and trust most profoundly. See, even my grandfather did the same. He died at 95, and he, he was this way too. So I've grown up hearing the nearness of the end all my life. They're, they're not just looking for something to happen. They're looking for someone they love to come. Oh, very much so. And I'm really blessed by that. Well, you can tell Uncle Arthur, who wrote Bedtime Stories, obviously likes God. Yes, that's right. Uh, I, let me ask you this, though. Did, did you expect to be here in 1984? Well, hardly. <laughs> well, we, we thought it was almost an expression of no faith to even suggest we would. Uh -huh. Maybe five or ten years down the line. But 1984, well, here when we, we are. were young, didn't That's uh, right. seem possible. What, what leads you to, to think of the end as, as near and, and the Lord's coming as being something soon? I've often thought about that. One could go through the biblical description of the events to occur. Another way would be thinking of the larger great controversy view. You know that God, to be consistent with himself, his government, the way he handles things, the way he treats his family, the way he treats the opposition, the way he wants to make things so crystal clear, you know he would end in a certain way. So I'm looking for things to end that way, and they really are, I think, well, like the gospel going to all the world. It's hard to measure that in some ways. There is another, though. The good news is based on the Bible. People have got to get hold of the Scriptures. Now, we don't print many Bibles ourselves. I don't know that we do it much at all. The Bible Society is doing a tremendous job. These Wycliffe people that go mm. to the corners yeah. of the earth and risk their lives to translate the Bible, that's one of the most marvelous things going on. Never has the Bible been so readily available or so readable in the history of the, of the whole uh, planet, you know, as it is now. That, that has to be. The Bible has got to get out to the world. And you're saying then that that would help to, to heighten the sense? That's right. The opportunity evidence. is increasing. Another one would be God will not release the four winds, the, the final uh, troublous events, until his people are settled. If I should see him apparently releasing him ceasing to restrain. He won't do it until his friends are settled into the truth. Things going on in the world today make one wonder if maybe the four angels are beginning to release their hold. But, but then there's another thing. The people in the world have got to re realize their freedom to ask questions, to make up their own minds. They cannot be dictated to as to the truth about God. And there's a great stirring and desire for freedom all over the world. Often people don't know how to handle it at first. But, the, but this, the sweep of the desire for freedom around the world is an important indication, also important, that there's an attempt to stifle it in certain parts in the world. Freedom is the essence of this thing. People must recognize their right to weigh the evidence for themselves. But maybe most of all, the counterfeit. Satan's final effort to deceive will be brilliant counterfeit. I think seeing the counterfeit developing is now, when the you most say when you speak thing. of counterfeit now, what, what do you see as the most serious threat or, or counterfeit? Yeah, you see, I don't see it as open opposition, you know, black versus white. It's going to be something very, very close to the truth. And the Bible speaks of the gospel going to all the world, the Holy Spirit being poured out, people seeing wondrous things. And I think, and I would not want to indict any individual in this, but I think there is a vast counterfeit spiritual revival sweeping the world. There are many innocent people caught up in it, and they're looking for the truth. I mean, I wouldn't want to point at any one person. But the, the emphasis in this counterfeit revival is not on the truth. It's not on weighing the evidence in Scripture. It isn't even about God. It's all about ourselves. It's all about our feelings. 
And there's great emphasis in this religion on get in touch with your feelings, get in touch with your feelings. The good news is get in touch with God. There's good news about God. We think about ourselves too much, and it can be depressing. But there's such an emphasis on feeling the power coming up through you. As I mentioned before, I notice it's often described as coming up through the feet, finally arriving at the head. The gospel is best apprehended the other way around. <laughs> it should come through the head first. The truth is apprehended by the mind, a mind that is sanctified by the spirit of truth. And there'll be great feeling. But to start out with feeling is very hazardous. Now, it is winsome. There's lots of love and tears are shed and the, there are miracles of healing and apparent conversion. It will be very close to the truth. But as a friend of ours once said, I am afraid of anything that would have a tendency to turn the mind away from the solid evidences of the truth as revealed in God's Word. I am afraid of it. I am afraid of it. We must bring our minds within the bounds of reason, lest the enemy so come in as to set everything in a disorderly way. By the way, that's Alan White. A magnificent statement. Just to clarify, at the beginning of your, your comment there, you said that the, the conflict wasn't a matter of black and white. You weren't talking about a racial, racial oh, issue at all. No, you were talking about, about the, the confusion, the shades yes. of, of uh, understanding and, and deception. Just as Satan will come as Christ, so the counterfeit will seem Christian. Hmm. What, what do you think is the greatest cause for delay. Are, are we contributing to this? Uh, you have spoken about God's patience and, and how the delay really makes God look good. Yeah. Um, but where might we fit into this? Uh, say, even with, with relative innocence here, that is, we might be candidates for the kingdom, but not giving the message that must be heard. See, that's the special assignment that Adventist little a uh, have been given. Do you think that's the greatest cause? I, I think the greatest cause is we're, we're giving a beginning message all the time and not a finishing message. We're giving a, a narrower view, a, a somewhat self-centered view. We're leading people to be gratefully preoccupied with their own salvation. Gratefully preoccupied, and I add the word gratefully, for what God has done for me uh, and you too. Mm -hmm. Preoccupied with ourselves. The finishing message, the great announcement to the world that will prepare the world for the deception is about God. We've got to talk about the larger view, the issues in the great controversy. We've got to help people understand the, the whole picture in Scripture. That's a finishing message. But meanwhile, we're even still using emergency measures to get people to be reverent and to behave. Um, so long as we still have to depend on rules and regulations and authority and pomp and circumstance and all the rest to keep people reverent, we're keeping them as little children until we can turn people free. Look, you're going to stand on your own someday. Better start doing it now. We're not giving a finishing message. What, what, what kind of circumstances or uh, situation do you think would will eventually move people to, to get ready to, to get this clarified? With, do you think it'll take some uh, fearful, fear-producing event, some world catastrophe or something like that? Now, that's often used, but fear is more the experience at the foot of Sinai. Fear gets one started. Fear is no way to finish. How the Lord will bring this about, I don't know. We, we talk of these things as acts of God and insurance policies sometimes. The thing is, when the opportunity comes, are we going to be ready to take advantage of it? When people want to hear the truth about God, the larger view, am I ready to help them find it? What's the best way to prepare for, for this, to take advantage of these opportunities? Well, I think understanding the importance of this larger, great controversy view, the truth about our God, and since that is to be found in all 66 books, there's nothing more practical, more concrete and essential than that we learn to read the Bible as a whole and as a major activity of the church to which we're proud to belong. I can't think of a more important one than a tremendous revival of study of the entire Bible, all of it, every story. Don't just give them to the children. We need to take the Bible back and read it through and through and get this larger view. Decide whether we like it or not. And if we're proud of it, it'll show through in the way we speak, not so much of ourselves, but of our God. Then when the opportunity comes, we'll be ready. 
You know, our, our theme tonight, How Soon Will the Conflict Be Over, takes me back to um, an event this week in which you led in our thinking at a funeral service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was impressed, Graham, with your assurance to all of us, the family and, uh, and to those of, who'd, of us who had come, uh, with your conviction about the nearness. Mm -hmm. His, he is coming soon. I wish you'd comment just a bit more on that, re review that for us. What do you mean when you say that? I, I remember you preaching up at Mountain View when I was pastor there. Uh, uh, how near is near? Yeah. And uh, this is a number of years later, <laughs> and here's the same, same note. I remember I used that title about 40 years ago up at Pacific <laughs> Union College, How Near is Near. I think historically the great event of His coming is just around the corner because what needs to be done could be done. And I think the increase of knowledge, which isn't Daniel 12.4, is occurring. Look at the technology now for communicating with the whole world. Incredible technology. The satellites. It may be possible to communicate with the whole world and give them this picture. On the other hand, the second coming is as near as our last moment of breath, you know. And that's why I think of it at funerals. When a loved one dies, especially if he or she has been ill and in pain. The next moment of consciousness, that person is face to face with the Lord at the second coming. And I love that Thessalonians passage which says, if someone dies before the Lord comes and they feel maybe they've missed something. No, Thessalonians says, they will arise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord. So the main thing is, more important than knowing when the end comes, is to trust God. And if I should die tonight, I want to die his trusting child because then I will arise his trusting child and I'll have no complaints. We can all have lots of questions. We might even say, I, I, I kind of wanted to live through that. I think Paul did. Remember though Paul said, I'm torn between staying with you to help you and my desire to depart and be with the Lord. He didn't believe in the immortality of the soul. He knew that as a Roman citizen when his head was cut off with that sharp sword, the next instant of consciousness, he'd be face to face with the one he'd been preaching about with such pride. So he'd have no complaints. So the end is really very, very near, especially in a medical center like this when we see folk come to the end of their lives all the time, sometimes very sad. We have good news for them. You fall asleep tonight, you'll wake up the next moment from a dreamless sleep face to face with the Lord. That's how near it is. Yeah. But I believe the big event is also near. Tonight is number 19. We have just one more Friday evening in our series. I want to remind our people here in our congregation and uh, at home and watching through video that we're offering this book, Can God Be Trusted?, which is a very nice review of our series, not a verbatim mm -hmm. report of it, but a review mm -hmm. which you wrote a number of years ago. We'd like to invite you to write for it. Just write to the University Church, Loma Linda, California. What's the zip uh, again? 92354. 92354. <laughs> and we'll be happy to send you a copy. Good. Thank you. 